Welcome to the Reader Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm your host, Corey Graham. Join us here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where the independent new authors come first. Sitting down here with me right now at the Reader House Author Roundtable, I'm really happy to welcome Dr. Byron Hardy. Byron, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here tonight. Yeah, and thanks for having me on. This is great. The pleasure is all mine, Byron, and I just wanted to congratulate you for your new book out titled Christianity and the Law of Separation. Can you tell me all about this book, Byron? Well, it really speaks to the heart of everything that is put into the Christian world and into our Christian worldview. So although we live in the world, Corey, we're called to be separated from the world, from the things of the world, be not conformed to the things of the world. And so that's why I wrote this book, was specifically as an encouragement as we get further into the 21st century to ensure that we'll be separated from the world and into the things of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is primarily a Christian book, of course, but is there something here for non-believers as well? I would say so, because this book is, is not only for Christians and discipleship, it's also a book of hope. In terms of there being those out there, Corey, that'll be listening to this, that are finding the world to be a dark place, a hopeless place. And as they read this, I pray that they're going to be able to see the illumination of Jesus Christ in the leading of the Holy Spirit, and that they'll accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior as a result of reading this, understanding that they have the ability to find that peace with path is all understanding, and that that'll guard our hearts and minds. Byron, can you think back to the moment when you got the idea for this book, and you thought to yourself, oh, i got to sit down and get started on this? Well, it's been in my brain for quite some time, Corey. I'm actually a retired police officer, so I spent 24 years working in law enforcement, and that has always been a piece of my world that has had this contrast between light and darkness, between good and, and between evil. So that's been in my thought for quite some time. And also with respect to the actual book, it comes out of hundreds and hundreds of hours where I have been working in the area of counseling. So I've been doing a fair bit of counseling over the last 14 years, doing some more studying. And as a result of that, you will see actually references in this book about counseling about helping those within your church community as lay people without necessarily having to be entitled as a counselor. This book is, is all about hope. It's about the future look. It's about separation. And again, it's about Jesus Christ. Now, Byron, when it comes to writing and being published and all of that, are, are you new to this or is this your first time? No, I actually published my first book in 2015. That was after my doctorate. So I did a dissertation on church democracy. So that book is actually entitled Democracy with the subtitle Biblical Principle or Man-Made Institution. And I published now these two books within, I guess, seven or eight years of each other. There's a gap in between, but I mean, life gets in the way sometimes. And that book was specifically just dealing with church governance models, with how people interact with one another in terms of membership or non-membership. And is it the lead pastor that leads or is it the board of directors, the board of trustees? So that's what that book was about. And that, as I said, Corey, that was 2015. So what's that moment like for you, Byron, whenever you open up your mailbox, you got a box in there, open up the box, and there it is, your first copy of your book. And you get to hold it and look at this thing for the first time. What's that like? It's actually a great feeling when you actually get your physical hand on a copy of your book. You're there for the publication process, for the editing, hundreds of hours of editing it takes mm. for a book. You actually have an involvement with cover design, and even though they send you the electronic format, the PDF of it, it's not really a picture in your brain until you're actually holding it, and then you're actually reading it, and then going through it again as part of an editing process. But it's a great feeling, and all glory to God for giving me the opportunity to do this for sure. While you were writing this, was it a smooth process for you, or did you hit some speed bumps, maybe some writer's block along the way? No, I actually have a bit of a gift in terms of writing, and, and God's given me that gift. And my brain flows in such a way, Corey, that it really never, ever turns off. So this book was mentally seamless for me and never had writer's blocking in it at all. 
I know there are a lot of readers out there that are going to be blessed in the pages of this book, and I encourage those listening right now to definitely seek this out. Again, it's titled Christianity and the Law of Separation. It's written by Dr. Byron Hardy, and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing, so you can get it everywhere, of course, like Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and iTunes, and also down the street at your local bookshop. Byron, it's been really great having you on the show tonight, learning all about Christianity and the Law of Separation and about your process. I had a really nice time. Great. Hey, thanks for your time, Corey. It's awesome talking to you. Have you ever known anyone who has a pet turkey? Well, I didn't, at least until now. I'm looking at this book titled Stephanie the Talking Turkey Finds a Home. It's written by Christy Stokes, and I get to find out more about this. Christy is here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Christy, welcome. Thank you for joining me here tonight. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Christy, can you tell me all about Stephanie the Talking Turkey Finds a Home? Sure. So I have four grandchildren, and two of them have a pet turkey. My oldest grandson is five, but when he got Stephanie, he was four, and he named her Stephanie. And then one day we were at the zoo, and I had all the grandchildren with me, and he saw a turkey at the zoo. And he thought that that was his pet turkey. Mm. So he he kind of had a meltdown because he thought that someone had taken Stephanie. So I was trying to explain to the lady standing next to me why he was upset. And she was like, so if he has a pet turkey named Stephanie, I said, he sure does at home. And like she he plays with her. She chases him. And she's like, wow, that would make a great children's book. So from there, we went home and started writing. Christy, I take it this is a children's book. For, is this for children of all ages or for more younger children? Actually, I would say probably younger children up to about third grade, third or fourth grade. Now, I've done some authors reading with children up to fifth and sixth grade, and they've enjoyed it as well. I do have some questions at the end of the book that promote reading comprehension on a little deeper level. So I like to get it into the hands of older children for that reason. Christy, when it comes to writing and publishing, that whole thing, are you new to this or have you done this kind of thing before? As far as that book, this is my first book in a series. Now, I, hmm. the second one is coming out soon, and then the third one's in progress also. But Disney and Talking Turkey Finds a Home is the first one that I've ever actually attempted to write and publish. Hmm. How long did this take you once you got started on it? The writing process was pretty simple. My, like I said, my grandkids kept shooting ideas out there at me. They told me what they wanted in the book. They were giving me ideas for many future books. I told them they had to slow down a little bit because <laughs> their ideas were something quicker than I could write. They'd given me a lot of the ideas, and it, go, it goes pretty quickly because it's their life with Stephanie. So mm. writing about real-life events is it, pretty natural. So I think for that reason, it's pretty quick. The thing that took the longest were the illustrations. And I saw this is illustrated by Melanie Stokes. Can you tell me about that? It is. So this is my husband's first cousin. She is an art teacher and she has her own art studio. And I just reached out to her when the book, you know, came to fruition. And I reached out to her and I said, would you like to be a part of it? She said, well, it's always been a dream of mine to illustrate a children's book. And the fact that she knows my grandchildren, she knows what they look like. She created the characters to look similar to the grandchildren. And so she, she did a great job bringing it to life. Yeah, the illustrations certainly are beautiful in this. Yeah, she did a really well job. So there's nothing like seeing that finished product, that physical product. So when that day came, Christy, and you got your first copy and you got to hold this book for the first time, it must have been quite something. Yeah, it was really exciting. And I actually had some of the grandkids over that day and so they were mm. super excited as well and to actually see themselves in the book. And we sat down and read it together. And it's been really special for them. So writing, publishing for the first time can be quite the learning experience. So is there anything that now you could throw out there for aspiring authors as advice? No, just go for it. I mean, don't be afraid. I mean, at first, yeah, the first step is always the hardest. But once you start writing, find the publisher that fits you and just go for it. It's been very rewarding to see my ideas, the kids' ideas, and everything come to life and see the final product. You're telling me about all those ideas that you have flying around. So do you ever deal with writer's block or is that a pretty easy thing for you? If I do, I'll ask the oldest grandson, he's five now, and I'll say, hey, you know, I'm stuck right here. This is what, and I'll read him what I have, and then he just automatically just goes with it. And he's like, well, can we write that she does this? And can we write that? And so he keeps me moving. <laughs> so the fact that it's kind of not just me writing from my head, but that I have their input as well, and that helps. 
I know this book is going to bring a lot of joy to a lot of readers as well, and I encourage my listeners to go seek it out. Again, it's titled Stephanie the Talking Turkey Finds a Home. It's written by Christy Stokes, and it's published by Covenant Books, so of course you can find it anywhere. Head on over to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes or also traditional brick-and-mortar stores, and you'll be able to pick this one up. Christy, it's been great talking with you tonight, all about Stephanie the Talking Turkey and about everything else you got going on. Thanks again for joining me. Well, thank you for having me. The book I'm looking at right now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable tells a truly extraordinary story. It's titled, What Dying Taught Me About Living. This is a book written by Scott Drummond with Sandy Ponton, and Scott is right here with me now, and we're going to find out all about this book. Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Oh, it's a pleasure being here today. Thank you. Absolutely. Scott, can you tell me all about what you've written about and what dying taught me about living? Sure. Well, I died for 20 minutes. I saw things that most people don't get to see. I saw colors that were brighter than I've ever seen before. And I met the right hand of God coming through the cloud. And what he told me was, it is not yet your time. You have more things yet to do. And I came back into my body. Now, when I came back into my body, there was a sheet over my head. And I lifted the sheet off, and there was a death certificate on my chest saying that I'd been dead for 20 minutes. Oh my gosh. Now, what happened to me was, it's something that was very personal and sacred to me. But it wasn't what I saw in my life after death experience. It was what I learned afterwards. Mm. Over the last 40 years, I've been trying to process everything that happened to me. And I've learned a lot. And the main thing that I learned was how to be kind to people and how you treat people. So basically, that's what I learned. I learned that money was not as important as I thought it would be. I learned it was all about how you treated people. Well, Scott, this book was quite a long time in the making. What made you decide to sit down, write your story, and publish it? Well, to be honest, I didn't want to ever tell my story. Hmm. It wasn't until a film producer came up to me and asked me one day, he said, I understand you're not afraid to die, and I told him that's the truth. I'm not afraid to die. He said, with everything that's going on in the world today, I think, People would be interested in hearing your story, and I told him no. He says, please reconsider and, and uh, tell your story, and I said no again. And he said, with COVID-19 going on right now, you would have the opportunity to give people hope. And I walked away from it. It was because of him and because of thinking about my story that I even came forward with it. Believe it or not, it's taken me 40 years to process what I've learned. It's not something you learn overnight. Well, Scott, you got to tell me about that day when your first copy finally came in the mail, and you got to hold this book. I mean, this is such a personal thing to you. It means so much. That had to be quite a moment. Well, this book didn't happen all at once. We, we took about a year and a half to write this book, and as you can tell, it's only less than 100 pages. But it was one of the hardest things that I have ever had to do, was to tell a story and try to put it in purpose where people could understand, because I saw stuff that we don't get to see here on Earth. But to hold that book, it was like something that had been lifted off my shoulders the day that they published it. It was the most unbelievable feeling, knowing that maybe there's a chance, through the words in the book, that I might be able to help somebody understand how death works. Now, Scott, what are the chances that you might write more? Do you have more to say? I have said no so many times about what I've done. I told them no, that I did not want to write a book. And then the book comes. Then I get contacted by a movie producer, and now they want to do a film about my book. And the movie will be called Don't Look Back. Well, Scott, we have a lot of aspiring authors listening to us. Do you have any advice that you could offer them? First of all, I don't, I don't really consider myself an author, but even though I have written a book, whatever you do, just stay with it. I had to listen to that little still small voice so many times when we were writing this book. Sandy Potton was my writer. Now, Sandy is from Fort Washington, and she's a ghostwriter. She first of all wrote the book in third person, and when we went to the publishers, they wanted it to be written first person. And Sandy, being a woman, was writing in first person for me as a male, which was one of the most difficult things that she said that she's ever had to do. But because of her experience, she was able to do it, and I'm thankful for that. 
I know a lot of readers out there are going to be blessed by this book, and I encourage everyone to pick this up and read this incredible story. Again, the title is What Dying Taught Me About Living. It's written by Scott Drummond with Sandy Ponton, and it's published by Covenant Books. So you can find it everywhere. Go to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes or down the street in your local bookshop. You'll be able to pick this up. Well, Scott, thank you again for coming on the show and telling me all about your story and about this book. I had a nice time talking with you tonight. Thank you. Appreciate the call. Joining me right now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable, I'm really happy to welcome author R.H. Coder. Bob, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me. Thanks. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure to have you here, and I want to congratulate you, Bob. you got a new book out called Satisfying Thirsts, Cleansing Souls, Eight Years in Haiti. Can you tell me about this? My wife and I, Joyce, were missionaries for uh, about 25 years, but for eight years we lived in Haiti. And this kind of chronicles some of the events that happened to us during those eight years and uh, how God worked with us and through us to accomplish a lot of things. Bob, what kinds of readers do you think would be really into this? Well, I think Christian readers, for certain, will enjoy the book. People who think they might be called by the Lord to go to the mission field. And I also think those who have not yet accepted Jesus might find it really interesting as they see how the Lord can work in unexplainable ways. So what was that spark that made you decide, hey, I want to write my story about being in Haiti and I want to tell the world about it? Was there something in specific you can remember? Yeah, there's two things, really. My wife, who unfortunately is now deceased, I'm sorry. was always on me saying, Bob, you need to write a book about everything that we've done, with everything we've experienced. And she used to tell me over and over to do that. And I started it many years ago and then just kind of hit a wall and stopped. And since her death, I felt like the Lord was kind of prodding me to get back and do this. So that's really the two emphasis points. Now, prior to this, have you ever done anything like it before, writing, publishing-wise? No, I never have. Never even considered it. We can blame this on God and my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, what did you find the most challenging part of the whole thing, even considering the publishing process, which can involve so much? Yeah, you know, I think the most challenging is starting each day. I could allow so many roadblocks to get into my head that well, I can't write today because I don't know what I'm going to do. Or I think the biggest challenge is just to sit down and start typing and let the Lord guide you. You got to tell me about that moment, Bob, whenever you got that first copy in, finally, of this, and you got to hold your book in your hands for the first time. What was that like? Yeah, it was pretty cool. It was a feeling of accomplishment, feeling of pride, a feeling of satisfaction and fulfilling something my wife had always wanted me to do. And just knowing that you had completed something that God was involved in also, it just, it felt really good. I'm proud of it. I hope it inspires and impacts people. What are the chances you might write another? Have you thought about that? Yeah, actually, at the end of this book, I said the next book will find us living in Honduras for nine years. There were a lot of people that came to work with us over those nine years, and uh, they're already hounding me saying, well, what are you going to write about Honduras? So <laughs> I need to get to that. I haven't started, but it is in my mind. Well, now that you've written and you've published for the first time, Bob, I'm sure you learned a lot. Is there any advice you have now for aspiring authors who are listening? I guess the first thing would be is don't get frustrated with your progress. You'll run into obstacles. You'll run into mental blocks. You'll run into frustrations going through the publishing process. It seems to drag on forever. But just stay the course and uh, trust yourself. Trust in yourself. You have a message to get out. You can do it. Did you find yourself trying to get into a routine of maybe sitting down first thing in the morning or maybe staying up later at night to write? Or were you just writing as you could find the time? At the time I wrote this book, the best free time I had would be mid-morning. And I tried to get into it daily at that time. I wasn't always successful, but that was my most fruitful time to write. And writer's block hits so many of us authors sometimes. Was writer's block a thing here for you, or because you were telling your own story, was it fairly easy? No, it, it was a problem. But when you're trying to cover lives over eight years, there are so many events that happen in every day of those eight years trying to decide what would be appropriate to put in or what you need to leave out and how to tell that story. 
I ran into that a lot. I think a lot of people are going to be blessed by this book. I encourage my listeners to go check it out. Again, the title is Satisfying Thirsts, Cleansing Souls, Eight Years in Haiti. It's written by R.H. Coder and is published by Christian Faith Publishing. So you can find it everywhere, like on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and also traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Bob, thanks again for coming on the show and telling me about your time in Haiti and about this book. I had a nice time talking with you tonight. Thank you. I appreciate the promotion. Celebrating 60-plus years of being a twin to a special needs brother. That's the name of the book. It just came out, written by Martha Hirschberger and Dorothy Hirschberger. And I get to talk all about this book tonight here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. The co-authors, Martha and Dorothy, are with me now. Martha, Dorothy, welcome. Thank you for joining me here tonight. And thank you very much for spending time with us this evening. And the pleasure is all mine. Can you tell me all about this book? What have you written about in celebrating 60-plus years of being a twin to a special needs brother? Okay, sure, I can tell you about it. We are from a family of seven children, the youngest being twins, Marvin and Martha. And Marvin is called Buddy, so we reference Buddy while that's who it is. Buddy was brain damaged at birth. And while this book highlights us being twins, my being a twin to a special brother, the main focus is our family's journey with Buddy. He's always been a very special part of our family. And he also started with epilepsy at age 16. And to uh, give you a visual of Buddy, he is a six-foot husky fella. And in his younger years, he was very active. However, he's really aged and we're now 63 years old. And some of our experiences in this book are with Buddy as being amusing, happy, sad, inspiring, frustrating, frightening, heartwarming, heartbreaking, but the underlying aspect of everything is love of family for each other, and particularly for Buddy. So the book has 184 pages and 107 pictures. Pictures speak volumes to help a story come to life. So, of course, most of the pictures have Buddy on it. Suffering brain damage is not a path we have chosen for Buddy. And I wondered what life would be with him as a twin already if it wouldn't have been that way. But we would have missed out on so much had we not had Buddy as Buddy is. What kinds of readers would be most into this, do you think? Did you have a target readership in mind? Well, I know some children who are thoroughly enjoying the book, but they happen to be Buddy's great nieces and nephews. <laughs> but I would think even teenage on up to seniors. And what was that spark, that inspiration that inspired you, Martha and Dorothy, to sit down and start writing this book, decided you need to write this story for the world? Well, when Buddy and I, I love Buddy and proud of Buddy, when we were nearing our 60th birthday, I wanted to do something to honor him to do with him, but he was no longer able to leave the house, so I knew it had to be something from home. So what we did to honor him was write a Facebook post on our birthday month that had pictures with it. My goal was every day for the first 25 days of April to write something and have pictures with it. And we got a tremendous good feedback from that. My goal to honor him in some way was what inspired us to write the Facebook page Because of that and the response we got from that, so many people told us we need to put that in a book. So once you sat down and started writing the book, was it a long process or did it happen fairly quickly for you? Well, we had two things we were concentrating on getting done, which both of them got out of our comfort zone. One was writing the book and the other was starting a YouTube channel, which we felt God was calling us to. So we decided to put the YouTube channel on the back burner, forget it, and concentrate on the book. So even though we had a lot of groundwork done with the Facebook post, we still had a lot of work to do to refine that, but added so much more to it. So moving forward, it took two years to have our manuscript ready to submit to a publishing company. And we didn't know where to go to submit the manuscript, but research, we found Christian Faith Publishers, and we liked what they had to offer because we knew we needed a lot of guidance to bring this to completion. And yes, we can highly recommend Christian Faith Publishers. And now we have our book and our YouTube channel at Hertzberg's Miracle Homestead. Oh, wonderful. Well, this is a story I think everybody should read. I think so many people are going to get so much out of this book. Again, the title is 
celebrating 60 plus years of being a twin to a special needs brother. It's written by Martha Hirschberger and Dorothy Hirschberger, and is published by Christian Faith Publishing. So head on over to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes or traditional brick-and-mortar stores, and you'll be able to pick this up. Martha, Dorothy, thank you again for joining me on the show, telling me all about Buddy and about this story. I had a nice time tonight. And thank you very much for spending time with us. Joining me right now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable, I'm speaking with author Jamie Q. Williams. Jamie, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here with me tonight. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it so much. I appreciate you being here, Jamie. I wanted to congratulate you on having a new book out in stores called We Are Where We Need to Be. So, Jamie, can you tell me all about it? Yes, sir. Most of the book is kind of like a re-image version of, like, when you want to explain to your kids, like, I guess, you know, I have young kids, 11 and 8-year-old. So it's kind of like a re-image version of, like, kind of like the birds and the bees without all the expensive, like, explanation, and just to give them the idea, well, per se, the kids, that they are kings and queens. They come from the heaven. Every kid is special. They come here with a unique set of things, talents, and things of that nature. So, so it kind of grasps the image to give kids a little bit more inspiration, especially in the climate of today's world. Hmm. That's a great message, Jamie. Where'd you get the idea for this? What inspired you to write it? Well, I, like I said, I have two little boys, and I think one night it may have came about with my kid. My oldest kid kind of motivated me to do it. His name is Elijah, and my youngest son's name is Micah. So I used to sit down and tell bedtime stories to him. So I was trying to find an interactive way to get them involved in these bedtime stories. So I would have them give me two characters. So, you know, little kids' imagination, they'll say, like, <laughs> Sonic or the other one to say, I want Transformers. <laughs> so I create a story based off those to kind of teach them a life lesson mm. in the message that I'm trying to portray to them just to give them something to think about while they're going to bed. That's fantastic. Well, Jamie, when it comes to writing and publishing and all of that, are, are you new to this or have you done it before? Oh, no, I'm very new. This is my very first manuscript that I have ever written. Oh, congratulations. How long of a process was it for you? The whole thing, writing, publishing, all of it? Well, writing it was the longest part. I didn't think I was going to get any feedback as far as anybody wanted to publish it or anything like that. But the writing actually took me probably about two to three years to come up with the concept to put it into a format where it can be understood. And then once that first copy came in, Jamie, and you finally got to hold this book after all that time, what what was going through your head? What were you feeling then? Oh, man, I was overjoyed. A little <laughs> overwhelmed at first, but I got a little overjoyed because it's, it kind of makes you feel solidified. Like it, it kind of gives you inspiration to want to do more. It kind of motivates you and maybe I am on the right path. But, you know, we'll see. <laughs> Have you given any thought to writing more after this? I have. I've, I've been running a couple of things through my mind. The way I write, particularly myself, is I come up with a title and then I write it backwards. So I come up with what I want the conclusion to be as far as how the book is going to wrap itself up. And then I just kind of dibble and dabble. I talk to a couple of people in just regular conversation. And I just hit them with a question. Hey, what do you think about this? If this was part of your life, how would you feel about that? If somebody explained it to you in this manner, how would you take that? So I kind of do my own independent research before I actually put pen to pad. So many of us authors deal with writer's block from time to time. It can be the worst. Uh, Jamie, is that something you deal with? I, I do at some times, but not as much as I thought I would have been dealing with because I kind of gain my inspiration just through conversation in everyday life. So I try to kind of reflect that into my writing, such as most of my inspiration right now come from my kids. Mm -hmm. Everything I do, I do for them. Like if you look at the second page in the book where it gives the uh, acknowledgement, their two names is in there. So it's pretty much everything that I inspire to be, I see through their eyes. What advice could you throw out there now to aspiring authors listening? Don't get discouraged. Most of what I realize is you got to take a chance on yourself because nobody really owes you anything and you'll never know what you get unless you're going to go out there and try to get it. Again, this is titled, 
We Are Where We Need to Be, written by Jamie Q. Williams and published by Covenant Books. So, of course, you can get it everywhere. Go to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes or traditional brick-and-mortar stores. You'll be able to pick up this book. Jamie, I really appreciate you coming on the show and telling me about this. Uh, I had a nice time chatting with you. Yes, sir. It's been a pleasure. I really appreciate this opportunity. There's a new audio book just came out written by Richard Osterman. It's titled Witches. And I get to find out more about this book. The author, Richard, is right here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Richard, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thanks for inviting me. I'm glad I'm here. Well, I'm glad you're here too, Richard. Can you tell me all about what readers can expect in Witches? A story about a young man that travels around his old country. You know, that his adventures as he's going along. There's love involved, even his love of his life, and he meets the king and the queen of his country. So, Richard, where did the idea for this book come from? How were you inspired to write this? The idea came from a dream, and that's where most of my writing comes from. And the dream was the first chapter of the book. Then how long did it take you to write it once you sat down and started on it? Three months. Then you have the publishing process after that. Was that a long one for you, or did that go quickly? It amazed me it was shorter to find a publisher who was shorter than I ever thought it would be from everything I've read on publishing. As I went self-publishing, I talked to a lady in one of the companies, and she said, do you have one seven? I said, yes, and I said to it, and she said, you was going to take it into the review committee, and it'd probably be two weeks before she hears back. The next day, she called and said, you're in. I'm sending you the paperwork. So is this your first time publishing, then? First time. Oh, is there any aspect of that that you found particularly challenging? No, it went real smooth for me, as far as I could tell. I mean, my first time doing it, so I didn't really know what to expect, and it just seemed to flow real well. I liked the people at the company, and they did what they said they were going to do. Richard, what was it like getting your first copy and holding that for the first time? When I got the book published, I couldn't believe that I had actually written that book. And every time I read through that book, I laugh and think, how did I do this? Because I just sit down. I don't do any research. I just sit down and write. Have you ever found yourself getting writer's block when you sit down to write, Richard? No, I haven't. I have been writing the novels since 2016. I wrote my first novel. Since then, I have written 17 novels and half a dozen short stories. But I don't know where it comes from. If I was not a writer the rest of my life, you know, I'm 79 years old. And it just, it's been just fun doing it. So, for you, Richard, now that you're published, what's the most rewarding aspect for you of being a published author? Watching the reactions of people that look at the book and say, you wrote this? That they're surprised. And they're amazed, too, because some of them would come back and say, that is an excellent book. So now that you've published for the first time, I'm sure you learned a lot along the way, Richard. Do you have anything as far as advice that you could give to the aspiring authors who are listening to us? I would say that for someone that's just getting in who wants to be an author, they need to sit down and write every day. Set a time to actually sit down and write. If you get to where you're, you know, and stick with it. Because what your ideas might just be a best-selling novel, but you won't know it if you don't write it down or put it on paper or in the computer. So, Richard, who inspires you whenever you write? You, you write an awful lot. You're prolific. Do you have somebody in your life who keeps you inspired and encouraged and motivated? My wife was the one that inspired me. I lost her two years ago. And now my sisters are inspiring me. You know, I'm working with a novel right now. I have 191 pages in it, 60,000 words. And before it's done, it'll be in the 70,000 word range. And when I finish a chapter or two, I take it to my sister and they read it over and they like it or they say, no, no, this is not, that doesn't fit in here. Was it tough for you to find just the right voice for your book? They provided me with three different people reading my book, and I chose which one I liked best. Again, I had my sisters listen to it, and some other people listened to them, all three of them, and they individually chose the same one. Well, I think there are a lot of readers out there, and listeners in this case, to the audiobook, who are really going to enjoy it. Again, it's titled Witches. 
It's written by Richard Osterman, and it's published by the Audiobook Network, so of course you can get it on Audible or the iTunes Store or Amazon, everywhere you pick up your audiobooks. Richard, thanks again for joining me here tonight and telling me about witches. I had a nice time chatting with you. Thank you for having me. A Mother's Heart. It's the new audiobook out, written by Deborah Ann Tinson, and I get to find out more about this audiobook. Debbie, the author, is here with me now. Debbie, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. The pleasure is all mine. Debbie, can you tell me all about what readers and listeners here in this case to the audiobook can expect in a mother's heart? Well, they should expect a lot of their lives with this wonderful inspiration. My family was inspirational. And it was inspired by not only but my mom, also my late daughter. For sure, it's thousand. And as you know, our passing in December of 2020, mm. then I was really prompted my heart to go ahead. I found his event before she passed away. And then after she passed away, I got the ending of it. And so my mom really was the most inspiring purpose for the book being written. And then I was able to incorporate my life, including my daughter's life as well, and a little bit of my granddaughter as well. And Debbie, I'm sorry for your loss. Did you have any specific reading group in mind? Any target readers for this? Technically, no, I didn't. But I really was trying to target more like, you know, mothers and grandmothers, people who adopt children, like, you know, that, that type of um, group of people. But overall, the book is for everyone. It's not done for a specific group. It's for all people. Man, woman, boy, girl, it doesn't matter who you are. If you read this book, it, it is a must read. Debbie, are you experienced when it comes to writing and publishing, or is this your first foray into this? No, this is actually my second book that I wrote. <laughs> yes, my second. How long did this take? What sort of a process was it like, clear from when you sat down and started writing it up until even the audiobook came out? It took me about, about a year. <laughs> Yes, about a year since I started writing. Then, you know, when you write, you put it down for mm -hmm. a moment. And see, that's coming in the way. My daughter got sick. So I kind of put the book to the side for a minute. And then, you know, after everything with her life, you know, you just, you know, I kind of said, okay, well, he passed. I said, time to finish this book. I got my ending. And that, you know, so it was about a year. Yeah. And then when you finally got that first copy in and you got to hold your book for that first time, Debbie, what was that like for you? Oh, my God, I was overwhelmed. So overwhelmed. I can't remember. I couldn't even believe it myself, but I even actually got it done. And I was like, oh, my God, this <laughs> book. Also, uh, all my friends, you know, my friend was on it. And I told her, and I said, no, oh, you got to see this. And my back, when we had the revision to be done, she was one of the person that helped you to get the revision as well. Yeah. Debbie, did you have other people in your life who knew that you were doing this as well and they could be there to support you and encourage you along the way? Oh, yeah. My entire church family, um, my dad was a Tanya, my mom, we lived in New York, so many friends and family members all over. Um, a lot of my godchildren, I have a lot of goddaughters, so they were a part of the, this whole ordeal as well. Wonderful. Looking down the road, Debbie, do you think you would do it again? Do you think you might write and publish more? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. As a matter of fact, I'm working on my third book. So based on your writing and publishing experience, everything that you've been through, Debbie, what advice now would you have for the first time, the aspiring authors who are listening? I need to tell Betty to be persevere and to be very oriented detail. Just detail everything that you know, happens in your life, no matter what it looks like. Just, you know, write it down and things that mean hire you, I would advise them to go ahead and do that because you never know when those things come up before you. That would be a thing that would take your life into your, your destiny. Well, I think this book is going to touch an awful lot of people, and I encourage my listeners to go check this out. Again, the audiobook is titled A Mother's Heart. It's written by Deborah Ann Tinson, and it's published by the Audiobook Network, so go wherever that you usually go to get your audiobooks. You'll be able to find this, like, on Audible or the Apple iTunes Store or Amazon, everywhere. Debbie, thank you again for joining me here at the Reader House Author Roundtable and telling me about your work. I had a really nice time talking with you. I find that it's talking with you, too. Thank you so much for your time. 
I'm delighted to be joined by author Janie Regglesworth here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Janie, welcome. Thanks for being here tonight. Thank you so much. Well, I just wanted to say congratulations. You have a new book out titled Sebrina, the First Seahorse Unicorn, The Adventure Begins. Janie, can you tell me about it? Well, it is a book about bullying. Hmm. I taught special education for 30 years. I was a public school teacher, and I taught the cognitively impaired kids. And on occasion, just like any other kid, they would get bullied. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we would have to do a lot of discussions about it. And there were also a lot of other social issues that my kids experienced. And I always wanted to do something to help my kids figure out how to deal with situations in life. And so when the pandemic hit, I decided to write a book about bowling on it, and that's how it started. Hmm. When it comes to the kids, would you say that this is for all ages of kids or younger kids, older kids? It's more for, I would say, six-year-olds to like 10 or 11-year-olds. And when it comes to writing and being published, Janie, have you ever done anything like this before? Never. It is way outside my comfort zone. Yeah, in fact, English was not one of my best subjects. <laughs> wow. Well, how long did this take you to do once you sat down and began it clear up until it got out there in stores? Well, during the pandemic, I sat down and I was bored and I loved to draw and I loved to paint. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to write a children's book. So I sat down and I wrote some notes on different topics that I wanted to write about. First one I wanted to write was about bullying. And then I thought about other topics. I have my best friend is gay, and I wanted to write a book on the topic of acceptance of people with alternative lifestyles. And I also have family members that have married into racist people. And so I wanted to write something about that. And cell phones. I really see a lot of problems with the misuse of cell phone, especially the kids not paying attention to what they should be paying attention to, mm. not having social interactions as much when they have the cell phones, there's the computers on, and different things like that. Mm -hmm. All those different topics came to mind. So I sat down during the pandemic and had a lot of months. I actually have five books already written. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I want to make it a series. It's fantastic. Yeah, and I have the second one all ready to go. I've got it illustrated, and I've got it because I illustrated my book also. Oh, wow. And the second one is going to be on cell phone misusage and texting. I mentioned texting and the first day of school for the fish world. I think I get better writing each book, so it's become kind of fun for me. Wow, I love it. Now, this is the first book of the series, and it's your first book that you've ever published. So what was it like that day when it finally came in and you got to hold it and look at this thing for the first time? I couldn't believe it. It was a dream come true. It was way outside my comfort zone because <laughs> I'm, you know, afraid that people aren't going to like it. And, mm -hmm. you know, they're going to think my outlook is cheesy or whatever. But it was a really nice accomplishment in my life. Mm. Now, talking about the publishing end of things, Janie, what did you find the most challenging part of it? Was there anything in particular? I think waiting. The waiting, you know, you have to wait for this and wait for that and wait for this. Because it took about seven or eight months from when I presented my manuscript and that it was accepted to get that book in my hand. And so I'm not a patient person. <laughs> <laughs> At least as far as waiting. I think this book will open up a lot of discussions about a lot of important topics, and I encourage my listening audience to go pick this one up. Again, it's titled Sebrina, the First Seahorse Unicorn, The Adventure Begins. It's written by Janie Regglesworth, and it's published by Newman Springs Publishing, so you can get it anywhere, like over at Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes or down the street at your local bookshop. I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. Absolutely, Janie. Thanks again for joining me here on the show. I had a really nice time. Thank you very, very much.
Sitting down right beside me now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable, I'm talking with author Regina Bennett. Regina, thank you for joining me here tonight. Thank you very much. Absolutely. I wanted to congratulate you on having a new audiobook out titled Looking Back, Individual Memories from Birth and Beyond, Sometimes Painful, Other Times Happy. Through it all, there is healing and remembering. Do or can you remember? But Regina, can you tell me about this audiobook? Yes, it's a book about a gathering of memories about myself and others. And it takes me back to young adult years, infancy to young adult years. It's a revisiting it of your memories, which can sometimes be painful. And sometimes, you know, you laugh, you cry. But through everything, there's healing in remembering. Regina, what kind of readers did you have in mind for this? Who do you think would be really into your book? Readers from all around the world and backgrounds because everybody has been through different things in life. And when you sit and think about it, it's like a keepsake. And they could use this as a guide to write their own book. So, Regina, can you tell me how you got the idea, how you were inspired to write this and publish it? Okay, I was inspired with COVID going on. It was the inspiration because family members and you saw people worldwide getting sick and in the hospital on ventilators and respirators. And everybody was in this room in, in their 60s and older. Hmm. And so I said, you know, before everybody, you know, has let me write something because, you know, people don't know about what goes on in one individual family. Hmm. And so even family members don't know about each other because everybody sees things from their own perspective. Regina, when it comes to writing and publishing, is this your first time or have you done this kind of thing before? No, this is my first time. How long of a process was this for you from when you first started writing it clear up until the book and audio book came out? I started in June of 2021. And it was published in December of 2021, the paperback and the ebook. And then in November now, the audiobook is being published. And my book came out in 2022. I'm sorry, December. Speaking of the audiobook, Regina, what was it like whenever you heard your book as opposed to reading it off the page like you were used to? Well, the person who read the book, when I heard it read, I think she did an excellent job. Was it a challenge to find just the right voice that you were looking for? It was a challenge because there were three different voice types that I speak from. But I was satisfied with the lady who read the book. Fantastic. So that day finally came, Regina, and talking about the hard copy again, you finally got your first copy in, and you got to hold your book for that first time. What was that moment like for you? It was really exciting, and I wanted to share it with everybody. So I was excited when it came. Looking down the road, do you see yourself writing more? Well, I'm not really sure at this point, but I would like to. When it comes to the publishing end of things, you know, there's so many hoops you got to jump through, so many things involved in that. Regina, did you find an aspect of that particularly challenging? You no, know, because I did a lot of research on who I wanted to publish the book. I was impressed with the one that I selected. And now that you've been through this for the first time, I'm sure it was quite a learning experience. So is there any advice that you would have now for aspiring authors who are listening? Well, I would say be truthful to their selves and tell it the way they see it from their own perspective. Do you get moments, Regina, where you're writing or you're trying to write and you get writer's block? And then how do you get through something like that? Well, you put your pen down and you just relax and it'll come back to you. And once thoughts come back to you, you just pick up your pen. It might be the middle of the night. You get up and you write down your thoughts. That's how I do. Again, it's titled Looking Back, Individual Memories from Birth and Beyond, Sometimes Painful, Other Times Happy. Through it all, there is healing in remembering. Do or can you remember? It's written by Regina Bennett, and this is published by the Audiobook Network, so get it everywhere that you like to pick up your audiobooks, like Audible or iTunes and Amazon, everywhere. Regina, thank you again for joining me here on the show and telling me about your work. I had a nice time talking with you. Thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed this edition of the Reader House Author Roundtable. 
where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. We hope to see you back here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first.